everyone, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. This is Bob Gassell. I'm here with Noah Diamond. Matthew Conium is on assignment. Um, actually, he's asleep. But today we're going to do something very special. We're going to play for you the entire interview Noah recently did with the great Les Marsden. Now, we played some of it last podcast, but we figured it was so wonderful that you should have the opportunity to hear the entire thing. So sit back, grab a drink, grab a cat, grab a snack, grab something, and enjoy. Noah, why don't you set the scene? Les Marsden is one of the key Marx Brothers revivalists. He is the performer most associated with the role of Harpo Marx after Harpo Marx. In 1978, he premiered A Night at Harpo's, a lovingly conceived and technically daring one-man show in which he played Harpo in and out of character and interacted with films, voiceovers, and the audience, and the harp. He originated the roles of Harpo and Chico in the original production of Groucho, A Life in Review in New York, London, and elsewhere. He later played the title role in that piece and directed several productions. But wait, there's more. He played Groucho in Minnie's Boys in Los Angeles and Harpo in Animal Crackers all over the place. Besides all of this, Mr. Marsden has done and continues to do extraordinary things in theater, music, conservation, and of course, more, a lot of which has nothing to do with the Marx Brothers. Nevertheless, we stayed on topic during an exuberant conversation about the brothers, their comedy, their music, and the art of recreating it. So here's my afternoon with Les Marsden in its entirety. I started by asking him about his earliest memories of our brothers and how he found his inner Harpo. I can't remember the very first time that I saw the brothers, but it had to have been when I was a kid or at least, you know, in a very young adolescent. And I remember it's that perfect age, and I'm sure many of us have in, con, uh, in, in common who were exposed to the, the brothers at an early age. You're at the perfect age where you identify with outsiders and I, iconoclasm, and uh, they just strike that. I mean, you know. They hit you in a way that Laurel and Hardy don't quite, because they're not the subversive outsiders that I think some of us are at that age. And that's all it took for me. I thought, wow, these guys are phenomenal. And and I wish I could recall the age I was, but it then became somewhat a practical application when a friend of mine in high school said, let's let's put together an act for the school talent show. And I said, great, let's do the marks for this. And I wanted to do Groucho, but my friend also wanted to do Groucho and he had a mustache and he wouldn't shave it off and so that kind of became that um, strictly because he was being stubborn and wouldn't sh shave off the damn mustache he got to be Groucho which was perfectly fine because at that point I realized just as Harpo did you know I can up upstage the Groucho guy without saying a word which wasn't my intent of course I wanted to perform with fidelity to the character and and the more I got into my research be I, 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 I'm compulsive and I always have been and the more I got into this need to learn everything I possibly could the more I fell in love with Harpo and at that point I think I, I had not yet begun playing the harp but I had already been playing virtually everything else and so it was an easy step then to uh, get access to the harp at the um, college where I then my senior year of high school they let me attend both at the same time so I was half of the day at the high school half a day in college already and so I got access to the, the harp practice room and began to teach myself the harp. And uh, that was the beginnings of that. And there was just, just something that immediately, uh, that, that harp sucked me in, you know. And it was a combination of what he did, but also the instrument itself. And plus, of course, what he did on stage, the, the absolute magic, the lunacy, the audacity. It's, uh, you know, what Buster Keaton called the impossible gags. And he tried, to, he tried not to do the impossible gag, but Harpo could. And Harpo got away with it. And it was brilliant because they were not impossible gags that relied upon special effects, at least not until they got into the, the later MGM films. You know, when he was on stage pulling this stuff off, that was part of the magic. It was not only the unexpected reactions, the unexpected actions that he would do, but it was then this completely novel, extraordinary conception of a character that was so brilliantly funny, inventive and funny. And heart. You know, he, he had everything. He had it all. 
Yeah, it seems like when the Marx Brothers are new and you're first getting to know them, uh, it's hard at first to reconcile Harpo's musicianship with everything else about his character. But uh, right away, it sort of contributes to the sense that he could do anything. And then when you, 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 know, you find out that he was not necessarily what we would describe as being an intellectual. That's the other layer on top of it, because he could do everything except basically read, you know, <laughs> and that, that I think also then puts an entirely new level onto it. It makes him a little less of this world and more of his own. My first uh, awareness of you was in 1992. I was 15 and I had this formative experience of seeing Animal Crackers at the Goodspeed Opera House. And among the many things that were revelatory to me about that production, uh, it was the first time I'd seen anyone other than my friends and me uh, imitate the Marx Brothers, particularly in such a fully realized, beautiful musical theater production. Uh, and everything about it was, you know, overwhelming. But when you played the harp, I remember so uh, vividly the palpable gasp in the audience um, because you had already, by that point in the evening, proven yourself as this uncanny Harpo revivalist. And it seemed too much to hope for that you would then sit down at the harp and deliver not just a harp solo, but a harp solo uh, worthy of Harpo. The feeling when you sit down at that harp as Harpo you sort of know you have an ace in your sleeve, right? Right, right. And and to me, just to back up a little second, though, it, it, it was so important to do that because I have seen too many people doing Harpo, and then either the harp is insulted by it being turned into a prop rather than a musical instrument, and it also denies a very important part of who Harpo was on stage as well as off. And so my feeling going way back to, and this was about the time I began developing the idea of my one-man show, was if I'm going to be playing Harpo, I have got to go out there and sell the thought. I, I want to make sure I can break that wall down as much as possible so that the audience can for a moment think, oh, maybe I really am watching Harpo. And I, that was so important for me. And and there, there always has been that wonderful, wonderful moment. And I tried to tease it a bit because you know that they're thinking, oh, how is he going to get away with this? There's a harp out there now. How are they going to, are they going to resort to the old, you know, shooting arrows out of it again and then it's gone? And so I've always teased that very moment of what to do with the harp as Harpo, you know, certainly not wanting to move myself out of Harpo and become less teasing as a heart, you know. But then that very beginning, and it's what you described, that hush, that, that all of a sudden the audience goes, he's playing. He really is playing. And then to build the solo in a way that it's like, okay, it begins a little simply perhaps or a little... Um, Nothing, nothing, you know, maybe somebody who could, but then to really get into it and do it in Harpo style and to, to embellish it with a lot of his own technique. And and so I want it to be something that, that not only will, well, the thing that was really cool, Susan, when, I, and I can't remember if it was early on when she first saw my show, um, said th that when I most reminded her of Harpo was when I played the harp. And that to me was one of the greatest compliments I could ever receive because that is, I think, one of the greatest um, challenges in playing harp. And if I had surmounted it to that point where that was such an important thing for her seeing it, then I felt like I really had maybe, maybe found myself worthy of playing her husband. Um, but yeah, it, it's so special. And the thing is, over the years, I can't tell you how many times people would sit there and applaud. And then after the, 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 the performance, somebody would come backstage and say, I have to thank you. That, that harp solo was just wonderful. You faked it so well. I, I almost thought you could have been playing it. And I would have to say, uh, guess what? I really was and the, you know the, 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 we would put the harp sometimes six feet from the audience we'd have it right down on the lip of the stage still people would all there would always be people who simply could not believe it was possible and you know to me it was not only possible but you had to do it I seem to remember it's 25 years ago uh, but I seem to remember your bio in that program ending with a sentence to the effect of 
And yes, he really is playing that harp. And I would have to put that in. Something else that I would do is I throw in clinkers from time to time. There would be times when I would feel as though I have to throw in a bad note here and there. I have to miss pedal. I have to do something just because, you know, it, it's going too well and people are thinking it's got to be recording. So, you know, because that happened to him in real life and you can certainly hear it in some of the harp solos where he throws in a clinker. You know, I'm sure he wasn't doing it on purpose because he didn't have to prove himself. But there were times when I would do that simply because it was like, okay, folks, I really am playing, and oh, here's an accident. That's not on the playback. Now, you're one of the, I think, the only person, to my knowledge, who has uh, notably played all three of the major Marx Brothers, and um, including, of course, their musical performances. And um, it always seems to me that there's such a distinction between Harpo and Chico um, and their approach to their solos. Um, the way Chico's piano solos are performative and... Um, um, comedic, um, and of course his technical mastery is astounding too. Um, but Harpo, except sometimes there's a few gags early in the solo, uh, it's dead serious business when he sits down to play the harp. And and there are those few moments, and I, they're actually in, and if I'm remembering properly, I think in that production of Animal Crackers, I did put one in the, uh, of those slight comedic moments, and that was, I think, after an arpeggiation, then there was, I think, a turn to the audience and a tink, tink, which I loved when he did that. But he... I, 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 to me, I was always slightly removed when he would do something like that. And I always, there was a little something inside that said, oh, please don't do that. Please. Because your heart, you're showing us your heart in all of that moment. And sure, yeah, the, the comedy is wonderful too, but there's something about him seeming to be emotionally connected on a different level uh, during the harp solos. And so when he would do those little moments, much as I loved them, I would always, there would be a little wistful, oh, oh, please stay in that, that other moment, you know, show us more of your heart. Um, but yeah, so I, I did that from time to time in, in, and I think I did that in that production in Animal Crackers, that revival. Those harp solos are really the only um, sort of down notes or reflective moments in in Marx Brothers movies, uh, completely sincere sort of passages of great sincerity. Um, and so I guess those moments are, are too precious to uh, contaminate with too much clowning. Right, right. And, and Chico, on the other hand, that was a, a, what a joy to do Chico, too, though. I mean, you know, I, Chico was to me the greater challenge because I am by nature, I think... I, I, I work hard. I try to perfect. And we all know how Chico really was, you know, and the fact that he would not put too much preparation in what he was doing, except, of course, the piano solos. He always had those aces. But to me, it was a wonderful freeing thing for me to be able to be a little carefree and careless, maybe, at, while playing Chico. And, you know, his timing was always impeccable. He was right there. He knew what he was doing. But there was just some – and, and that, that goes back also to my conception of playing all three of the brothers. Whenever I played them, I was not going to go out there and play Harpo. I was not going to go out there and play Chico. I was not going to go out and play Groucho. I was going to play Adolf Arthur portraying the character of Harpo. It, because, you know, you need those that layer. You, you've got to have that, 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 that depth, I think, to what you're doing. Because that's what they were doing. And it was, you know, Julius was playing Groucho. You know it. And, and the same thing with Leonard Chico. And I think that in his case, uh, I think we saw less of a difference between the real man and the character. He was very close to that character. Um, you know, from everything Maxine you know, used to tell me, and we had long, long conversations about what her dad was really like. She did not necessarily have the most objective opinion about her dad. She was so in love with her. I mean, daddy, dad, it was daddy, daddy, daddy. Just, just love. You know, the man had been dead for decades when I first got to know her. And yet it was as if he had just died the night before. She was so in love with her father. And that says something, I think, more about him than her. It, 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 it you know, Betty, that, that famous line that Betty said, you know, and I think Maxine may have said that she asked her mother mother. Why is it after all of these years, why is it, you know, you know, he cheats on you all this and yet you still put up with him. Why? And Betty said, you know, Maxine, even to this day, 
when I hear his, his step on the stairs outside, my heart begins to beat a little faster. And that says so much about him. And that was part of what I would always try to capture in playing Leonard, playing Chico. You know, again, again it was it was an easy departure if you were playing Leonard to then bounce off and become Chico. Um, you know, I, 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 I so wish that I had had a chance to know both Harpo and Chico. I so wish I had had that opportunity. And I think Bill has told me, well, you know, it's probably a good thing you didn't because you probably wouldn't be quite so fascinated by them had you actually known them. And it's probably a good, uh, valid point. Uh, you did get to spend a little time with Groucho in 1976. Yeah, not a lot. He and, and he was at that 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 point a shadow of himself. Uh, but yeah, I got to go to the house and 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 I have vivid memories of, of all of that. And and, and the, the funny thing is that I, I recall so much, except whenever I try to think of his face, I have a blank right here. And of course, I know what he looked like. But you know, being in the house with him, uh, you know, I remember everything. I remember you know the you bet your life duck hanging from a shadow chandelier in the dining room and I remember looking out uh, there was a little uh, rock garden uh, and there was a rubber duck sitting on top of the whole tree by the door with the wigs and I you know I remember everything about that house and him in it except I have a little blank when it comes to his face and and, you know I recall our conversations and everything of that but but uh, you know to me and I don't know if that that is some sort of um, if it's my mind trying to keep him in some other special ethereal realm or what but and and not wanting to embrace Groucho as being part of reality I I don't know what but uh, you you say maybe you never forget a face but in his case you made an exception yeah (laughs) that's a very good point I never thought about that Uh, so just a a couple of years after you met Groucho, I guess, is, was the debut of A Night at Harpo's. And I've I've read about that show, and I know a little bit about its content and its history, um, but I still uh, struggle to wrap my mind around the conception of a two-hour, two-act, one-person show about Harpo Marx. For me, the very beginning was, I mean, I thought, sure, it'd be easy enough to go out there and do, you know, two hours of recreating Harpo of the character, um, or maybe not quite so easy, but at least that would be a roadmap. And I thought, what compels me the most about Harpo? And that is, what was he really like? What was he like in real life? Did he speak? You know, because a lot of people said, oh, uh, he couldn't speak, could he? And in fact, uh, uh, I, right off the top of the show, you hear me in voiceover as Harpo saying, um, and I, I, I can't remember where I read this, but it was apparently a true story that um, uh, somebody walked up to Groucho and said, um, uh, uh, Harpo really speaks, doesn't he? And Groucho said, no, and walked away. Way. And that's how I begin the show in voiceover. Um, and to me, it was very, very important to reveal a lot of the things that I felt that I could reveal because I wasn't actually him, but an actor portraying him. Um, you know, you would not expect Harpo, except, you know, maybe at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium or, or Santa Monica Civic Auditorium to go out there and speak to an audience. But what I told Susan from the very, very beginning was that, and, and again, I was this dopey kid in college when I first approached her. And the very beginning of that was I, when I was still in, in college, I thought it would be so cool to do this one-man show idea on Harpo, but what I really wanted to do was show what he was really, really like because so many people do have these misconceptions. They don't have a clue about what he was really like, and, and they just think maybe that's how he was off stage too. He was always wearing this wig, and he never spoke, and he flitted around and did things to people. And so I I managed to get Su- Susan's contact information, and I, I um, called her up one day out of the blue, and here I was. You know, I was like 19 or 20 or something, and I, I said, Hi, you know, I'm, I'm calling you. Uh, I, I would love to, you know, a kid in college, whatever I said. And I would love to do a one-man show on the life of your husband, if you wouldn't mind. And she said, well, I would mind. I would never allow that. Goodbye. And hung up. And that was it. And so I wrote her a long letter. And I said, look, please don't tell me I can't do it till I've had a chance to at least talk to you in person. So I sent that off didn't hear or hear a word back from her and you know months literally went by and I gave up on the idea because I did not want to do anything like this without her permission there would be ways of working around you know he's a public figure there are ways of working around the family but I never wanted to do that I wanted to work with the full cooperation of the family and I wanted to also try to work with the objective uh, cooperation of the family too if there were things that I felt the, the, the family was being a little too careful about out 
I wanted to perhaps convince them that maybe these were things the, the public would like to know. And so, you know, the, it, it, there was no response. So in the meanwhile, I thought, OK, well, I love Buster Keaton, too. How about a Buster Keaton one man show? So I, I found Eleanor's number and I called her up and bingo right away. Oh, yes, I think that would be lovely. I'd like to talk to you about that. And I said, terrific. Uh, you know, so then I got a letter back from Susan and Susan said in her letter that was still fairly short and curt, um, you know, I, you can come down and meet me, but you can't do a show. And so we set up time for that. And you, you probably read this. I, I think that's in one of the interviews. And, and she completely flummoxed me when I, I had this uh, terrible comedy of errors on the way down there that day. Because a woman hit my car at a gas station in Encino and, and uh, you know, all this stuff. And it was burning hot. It was July in, in the springs. And I finally got down there late. And I, I stopped at a Safeway and picked up this dumb little bouquet of flowers to, you know, help smooth the way. And so I got there late and, and, and went right running up to the, the front door and, and she answered it. And I thought, you know, it's going to be this, this woman who's going to hate my guts. And, but it was this sweet little angel and she answered the door and she said, you must be less come on in. And I said, I feel terrible. I'm so late. I, you know, and she said, Oh no, 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 don't worry about that at all. Would you like some lemonade? I was just going to make some lemonade. It's so much better with limes. Don't you think I, I'm going to go next door to the neighbors and I'm going to get some limes and, you know, look around the house, enjoy yourself. And I'll be right back. I thought, you know, what is it? She doesn't doesn't know me. And so I, I, but here I was in Harpo's house. You know, it was not the house he had lived in because, you know, that was, he had, he had died before she bought this house. But here were all of the things. I mean, there were some, some of the Decker paintings. There were Harpo's own, you know, the Harpo's Blue Boy, Har, you know, or the Laughing Cavalier and, and the four Marxists, remember? And, and, and there were his own oils. And, and I saw that, that's when I saw the accordion player and her top banana frame that she had made for it. all this amazing stuff. And, and so then she comes back in a few minutes and the first thing out of her mouth was, well, I feel like I can trust you. You can do whatever you want with the show. And and I thought, why did you put me through all this? And I don't think that was her intention. But I think that once she, she uh, hopefully, that, that she saw that I was sin sincere and that I wanted to do what I wanted to do with fidelity to the character, and it was because of a love of the character. But then, you know, I said, this is how I want it to work. I would love to show what he was really, really like. I would like to speak in his voice. And I said, but the one thing I will not do is speak in the costume. So I want to have Harpo become Arthur Marks. And and I at that point I because of the fact that it was it was very early on I only had some slight ideas of how I wanted to to approach this, but I, I explained to her what I wanted to do and she liked the idea and our, on our first day we spoke for like four or five hours just, you know and I've, I've got tons and tons of hours of interview tape with her um, and and she insisted that I meet the kids and and that was kind of the beginning of the whole thing and so then I would you know keep her apprised of what I wanted to do and how as I was writing it and the the strange thing was that the actual writing of the play was was like pulling teeth. It was killing me. I had a, a premiere date set up for the university. And the problem was, as the months went by, I would write a draft. I would hate it, tear it up, throw it away. Write another draft, hate it, tear it up. And we were finally getting a little too close. And I still didn't have a script. And I was starting to, you know, of course, not sleep too well. And I was starting to have all of those concerns. And could I really do this? And then one morning, I, well, I woke up in the middle of the night and the play was right there in front of me. It was like all I had to do was get up the next morning, start writing. And it was all there. And it was amazing. And I still can't understand how that happened. But and I've never had an experience like that again. But that was that. And, and that that script has had very, very few changes. Um, that was the script. I, I, I remember at one point um, there was one line, one word. And I mean, there have been a few changes, but I, one that I remember particularly, uh, I had Harpo talking about uh, a streetcar. And Nat Perrin came to see the show. And he said, oh, Harpo never would have said streetcar. He would have said trolley. So fine, I changed streetcar to trolley. And that was one of the changes. Um, but that's kind of how it all began. And that's how... 
I think I saw the possibility of having a two-hour show about Harpo because it was all the stuff that I wanted to, to have him tell an audience. And I wanted to also make it as honestly what Harpo could have done rather than what Harpo, what I would have liked Harpo to have done. I didn't want to have him go out there and do things that he wouldn't have done. The second act is kind of fun because there's a lot of voiceover from Susan. And I took some of the reels. No, no. I I because that that would have been inartistic to have used her own voice. So I would always have an actress. And 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 my favorite actress doing the role, she was absolutely wonderful, Ann Nelson, who played the little old lady in the airplane, the first airplane movie, uh-huh. the one that was in, who, who was like bored to tears and hanged herself. She did an amazing Susan. Her voice was just like Susan. And so it was wonderful for me to be on stage and the the concept was was that I was not hearing Susan, but that here I was and she was commenting on what I was doing at certain points. And 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 it worked so nicely. And so it basically moves chronologically through his life from the very beginning to near, nearly the end. Of course, you can't have him die on stage. And 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 I didn't want to do that anyway. But, he, you know, near the end, all of the, the infirmities began to get caught, caught up with him. And then I leave it on that level that he left, leaves uh, uh, um, Harpo Speaks. And that was You're Only Young Forever where you know, after he had been told he can't play the harp, he can't do this, he can't do that because it'll kill him, he realized what's what's it worth living for anyway then. So he gets rid of all of these things, he goes back to playing the harp because you're only young forever. And that's how the, the show ends. Um, but, you know, so that's how you deal with doing two hours of harp on stage. Do you think because of your interest in the Marx Brothers and you've been so involved with um, developing uh, this kind of psychic connection with Harpo and the time you had spent with Susan, uh, do you think um, sometimes with writing, it seems like your unconscious does a lot of the work for you? And I, I, I don't have an exact experience like that, but what you describe sort of having had this work percolating in your mind over time, but not knowing exactly how to get into it. And then you wake up in a cold sweat and there it is. It's like you were actually maybe on some level working on it and writing that script just during your walking around time. As they yeah. Say. Well, and there was an interesting thing. I mean, I've never been into the with only with only few exceptions. I've never been into accepting the inexplicable inexplicable. But um, at one point, just when I was developing the show, I was doing another show that was written by the the great old songwriter Earl Robinson, who, who wrote, um, among other things. Um, you know, the ink is black, the, or the, the paper is white. Uh, he wrote a ton, a wonderful old left winger. And I was doing a show that he had written. And one day he said, I'm going to go to my psychic. Do you want to go? And I said, what do you mean you're psychic? And I said, I've got a psychic. And I said, okay, yeah, it sounds like fun. So I went and, and uh, you know, Earl said, do you want him to read you? And I said, well, read me? Well, you know, am I an open book? And he said, no, 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 come on, give it. It's fun. And so Earl, did not know anything about the the Harpo play. Not a not a thing. But so I get there with Earl and there's a psychic and um, the guy was interesting and he said I'm going to read your your aura and I said fine sure right yeah and so he starts telling me things about myself that you know anybody could kind of figure out but then he says you know I've got to stop because I'm you know there's there's a little um, figure on your shoulder and and he's on your now he's on your right shoulder and I said well describe him and he said well um, I I don't know how I, I blonde curly hair um, and then he, he began to describe something that could amorphously be Harpo but he didn't know a thing about the Harpo show Earl did not know anything there was no way you know and it was way before anything was going on and I thought well isn't that interesting if there is this little aura out there that is Harpo I'm more than happy to channel it so, you know, I, you know uh, that was kind of nice. Absolutely. Yeah, that kind of thing. I always feel like even even the effort to try to explain something like that takes away the, whatever poetry it has, you know? You just have to go at those things when they come up. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, hopefully things like that have given me a, a slightly more open mind. And, and I think, too, there is, uh, with or without any... Um, 
a supernatural angle. Um, just the act of um, getting into those guys' skin and just going out as them, uh, it does have a kind of a profundity to it that transcends um other acting work certainly mm-hmm. um and yes i don't i don't know um yeah i can't explain it either and i'm i'm as you are a little bit resistant to reach for uh for supernatural explanations just because of the absence of a natural one right uh, right right <laughs> but there is indeed uh something uh we could say magical about it I, I agree. I fully agree with that. And I've always felt that there's a relationship directly between your own sincerity and perhaps a receptiveness to some forces out there. Um, and I've always felt pleased and proud that the work that I have tried to do as all three of the Marx Brothers has been leavened with, at least as far as I can make it, respect, sheer fidelity as so much as I can make it. Um, it, it, Trying to to be completely and totally honest about them, who they were, and and paying homage without at the same time, uh, you know, um, whitewashing them. I'm, I'm, I, I hope that there's always been a feeling, um, and I think that if you feel that, if, if you work so hard and you are knowing that you are working so hard, it then uh, lifts your own performance of it. If, you, if there's a slight bit of a doubt and you're saying, oh, I'm going to do this because it's cheap and it'll get a laugh, and it's not really them, it will, it will damage what you're doing. Even if if you don't think it will, yeah, there's something emotional about the Marx Brothers, isn't there? Which I, I'm always so perplexed by, by because they themselves, as performers, um, never tried to appeal to our emotions very much, or, or at least not to our sympathies. Um, and yet, uh, we who love them, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure this is true for. Uh, for you, and I know it's true for so many fans, even who have a more casual kind of acquaintance with them, it's deeply moving to think about them, their faces and their voices and the way they moved. Uh, it, it Partly, I think it resonates with our childhoods when we all first discovered them. Uh, but for guys whose act was so broad uh, and so antic, um, we sort of respond to them as though they were great poets. Yeah, there's something also about the fact that these guys, in Harpo's case, a guy who was born 130 years ago and who died what, 54 years years ago. The fact, is that right? 50, yeah, 54 years this year. Um, the fact that that should be so far past in history and yet is so well connected to who we are. And and to me, that's always been an, an important thing. It's one of the things, you know, I'm always agog a, a with in music because, you know, here we have, you know, if I'm, if I'm conducting a piece by Brahms, here's a guy who was born in 1833 and in Germany, in, in, in you know, so far removed. And yet somehow his music, these many, many years later, he's been dead for 120 years. And yet his music still can make an audience go, wow, and blow the, an audience away through time, through through a different content, continent, and the same thing was true of the Marx Brothers. Harpo, particularly, as you know, was universal, and especially when you know Exacto Map Case went to Russia. Even though he was a contemporary, he was performing in his own time. He bridged that cultural divide, even though the Russians had to have the translator then let them know when it was okay to laugh, and. To me, it's it's so they are universal in a way that very few performers were. I mean, you know, you take a look at a film of Sarah Bernhardt acting and it's like all over the place. And she was the greatest actress of her day. But does it work today? No. You take a look at the marks for this. Oh, it's just as time. I, you know, it's, it's as if they were performing yesterday. It's as if they were it would, taking that that whole you know defiance of convention and the way in which they did it. Um, you know, just a few nights ago, I hadn't seen coconuts in a billion years. I mean, it had been so long, and I've you know, of course, the new Blu-ray set. So I, we watched coconuts, and and my son is twenty, and he's seen them all. Of course, I raised the child properly, so he knows everything. But still. There is something, and it's a very simple 
tiny line, but it's when uh, what's his face Yates is 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 uh, giggling at the table and the oh I don't know what to say I didn't and so uh, then Chico says oh, then why don't you shut up and I, it's <laughs> such I mean it's a simple simple moment it's not necessarily the most artful of moments but it's just such a wonderful moment because it's exactly what we were all thinking. And it's that's what they're all about. They communicate with us, and so as whether it's as an audience member or a performer, it, it's so easy to and comforting to slip into those skins and go out and play them. Even though, unfortunately, I haven't done so in, in nearly twenty years now. Do you still laugh out loud when you see them? When you oh, watch absolutely. the films? And- absolutely. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, as as with you, I'm sure I have seen those damned films over and over and over and over. I mean, you know, I, I first began seeing the marks of those films before you were born and and they still make me laugh you know with the exception of course of the, of the big store but um <laughs> or go west um but uh, we won't get into that right now um but yeah yeah uh, it's just because it doesn't matter how many times you see it it's funny is funny I find when I see the films now, yes, of course, they're so familiar. You can sort of just close your eyes and watch them anytime you want to. But um, I find when I see them now, um, Harpo is the most likely to make me laugh out loud um, because I think Groucho, um, because I've made such a particular study of him and tried to get into his voice and skin so much, um, it's very hard for Groucho to surprise me. Um, in the films, uh, You Bet Your Life episodes that are less familiar to me, he can still uh, surprise me uh, wildly. Um, but uh, but if I just concentrate on Harpo, I still see things that I don't know if I've ever noticed them before uh, that can set me off. And it's, I think and it's why Woolcott, for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, 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 Picked on him as being the funniest, and you know, and why he said Harpo Marx and some brothers. It, it was there was something so special about him, and I so wish that I could have seen him in I'll say she is, and seen him on stage in Coconuts and Animal Crack. In the very early beginning, he was the special one in a way that Groucho later would become. Groucho later became the ringleader. At the time, Groucho was a little more conventional, and Harpo was this this out- otherworldly being who was so incredibly funny because he was so incredibly inventive and you never knew what was going to happen next and what he did do what you know it wasn't just oh yeah that's funny it was like oh that's brilliantly funny and you admired it on an intellectual as well as an emotional level what he did groucho you admired i think intellectually but of course not as emotionally and and to me and i don't want to you know place one above the other but i think that's why in the very early days harpo was the one who really stood out as the special member of the act and i think that then when they got into the films more and more. The writing then developed Groucho more and more. And I, I'm not sure if that was because of what Kaufman did. Um, not sure, because, you know, a, a Groucho attributes Kaufman with having created the character for him, which, you know, is not necessarily true. But I do think that uh, in time, uh, there was a shift in that, that. And I hate to use the word paradigm because it's used so often these days. But there was a shift in, in, in the the focus of who was the standout brother and the, the, the funniest brother. Uh, for me, it was always just a, a tremendously funny team. I only wish that they had had more moments as all four brothers together. It's one of the reasons I like monkey business, and particularly the opening scene, and, but also a lot of the shipboard stuff where they do have work all four of them together. And and you know you don't have that in all of the all of the films. So, you know, and poor Zeppo. You know, Zeppo gets his due a little bit more. To me, it's still nearly criminal that that you know we went from the four brothers to the three brothers. But then again, it's nearly criminal that we ended up at MGM and all. But yes, but I I completely. I completely agree with you, and and although yeah, I mean there's there's uh, there are two attitudes, there are two possible attitudes to take towards Zeppo, <laughs> and I think I think we all take the positive attitude, uh, which is that the four Marx Brothers were the essential comedy team we love, um, and the three Marx Brothers were a, a cherished later incarnation. Um, and, you know, when we were working on I'll Say She Is, um, other than Coconuts and Animal Crackers, for obvious reasons, Monkey Business was the film we used most as a reference for the cast because it presents the four of them as a unit in a way that uh, the films after it really don't. Just the spirit of the four of them just running down the uh, deck of that ship is very much um, the way I think it must have felt to see them on stage. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and there is also something about Zeppo's... Um, 
Zeppo's very lack of a character, um, that so that the only thing that's really important about him is that he is a Marx brother. But what could be more important than that? Uh, the thing that was cool about him, though, if you look at him, particularly in Monkey Business, is he's the most normal. He's almost like one of us but with a slight bit of an edge. The other three, they're way out there. I mean, they're over the top, but we might be able to relate to Zeppo as being one of us a little bit more because he looks like one of us and he mostly acts like one of us, but then he comes up with these little bits of lines here and there. And I think that in a way that makes him more something, you know, he's the every man that we can latch onto and place ourselves within the Marx Brothers. And, and, and you know, at least for the layman and lay, lay woman to a certain extent, in. Um, and, and I think that there was an incredible value in that, in what he did. But I, I always felt sorry for him for being born in 1901 and being the last one. Everybody said he was the funniest one of all off stage. And, and of course, that old story about when he replaced Groucho as Spalding and then Groucho recovered from his appendicitis really, really quickly because Zeppo was getting great laughs and great reviews. Boy, of all the of all the many events in the Marx Brothers timeline that I wish I could somehow travel to and witness, uh, Zeppo understudying for Groucho um, is high on that list, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would have loved to have seen that. So, and so there's a there's a period of your career that's very focused on the Marx Brothers. Um, directed uh, Groucho, A Life in Review, um, originated the Harpo Chico role in that show, and then later played Groucho uh, to great acclaim in that show. Uh, you did Minnie's Boys, you did Animal Crackers. Um, but in addition to that, you have this very robust career of in the theater playing characters who were not the offspring of Minnie and Frenchie. Uh, and you've been a political candidate. You And the work that you're doing now as a conductor and with the symphony, um, I mean, you have done so much. Uh, how? To what extent are the Marx Brothers with you every day now? I would like to consider, you know, that's a great question. Uh, they are not with me in, you know, overtly. I think that if anything, I would like to say that I was inoculated with the Mark Brothers. That I, I, they, you know, it's funny because people ask me for years, um, in real life, perhaps I tend to give, you know, not necessarily here today, but I, I tend at times to come up with some very quick lines and uh, sometimes do some things that are, are physically out there that get a laugh. And I don't, you know, I, I have been told or, or or people have said, oh, you're, you're just, you know, the, the Marx Brothers, you just picked this up from the Marx Brothers. And I have to say, no, that's how I always was, even before I knew the Marx Brothers. And, and I think that's why I gravitated to the Marx Brothers. And so whether or not I truly was um, given a shot of Marx Brothers at birth or, or what, that's how they still are in my life. And they, they always will be. Um, you know, I, I, I believe profoundly in the importance of laughter, The you know, what it can do for us as human beings, what it can do for, to bring us together as human beings, um, what it can do to, to make us healthier human beings. And so for that reason, and because I, I view them as being nearly the pinnacle of all that is funny and all that ever was funny because of the broad range of everything that's found within who the Marx Brothers were, the physical comedy, the verbal comedy, everything that there was, you know, the, 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 they're, they're the closest thing that we had to a, a Commedia dell'arte, you know, uh, maybe prior to Monty Python coming back into the picture, picture. Uh, but but to me they they were and still remain the most important element of comedy. You know we can all have our preferences. There are some people who like you know Burns and Allen. There are some people who who, who love Laurel and Hardy. There are some people who love contemporary comedians. You know there are people who love Adam Sandler. We started there. But I think that when you think of a beautifully contained representation of comedy, of human beings, of what the range of comedy means, of, of what all of the performance of comedy is, I think that you can find no better example than that which is within the Marx Brothers, that broad range of approaches to comedy, and also the high success rate of what they did, because there's not much that they did that doesn't get a laugh or at least you know it doesn't at least provoke a smile and and so much of what they did do 
it just makes you erupt in guffaws. And so for that reason, they will always be with me. They will always be part of who I am. And, um, you know, I, perhaps at times to the embarrassment of my wife in public. But, you know, too bad. You know, she knew what she was signing on for. I, I make that point all the time. One thing, it seems to me that there is this kind of family of artists and performers who have dedicated themselves at least partially to uh, recreating the Marx Brothers, giving audiences a sense of what it would have been like to be in the theater and watch them. Um, You and Frank, of course, come to mind first as the two guys who have done that so superlatively and on such a large scale. Um, and I shyly include myself in, as uh, at, at least uh, one who aspires to that. Um, one of the things I've learned about it over the last few years is that when you put on the makeup and go out as a Marx brother, you feel an awesome sense of responsibility uh, to this cherished legacy. Um, but along with that feeling, you realize that what's creeping in is reverence. And Irreverence is, of course, what you need to have more than anything to be a Marx brother. And trying to uh, thread that needle and find the balance between reverence and irreverence um, seems to me a big, important part of that puzzle. Um, I know you have um, uh, a philosophical approach to this and and many um, strong ideas about what it means to play a Marx brother and and how it should be done. Give me a few pages from the book of Marsden. Sure, sure. I mean, and it's easy enough to say what I don't like because I've seen plenty of it. And But before I do, I want to say right here for the public record, if there is one, that I hereby view you as my illegitimate offspring because <laughs> I want to return the compliment, what you have done for them, um, you know, and certainly in the resurrection of Alsace is, is beyond belief. And, and the fact that it, you, you put so much work so much detail work into it, but then it was done with such great fidelity. And as I've mentioned several times, that to me is the pinnacle of what you should be doing. And beyond all of that, you do a damned great Groucho. So I want you to know how proud I am to pass the torch along to you. And I mean that sincerely. I I feel honored that we're sitting here speaking this way today. I, I, I felt so touched when you first reached out to me, when you first communicated to me, because um, of the, you know, the, the, the respect that I felt from you. And and I want you to know that I share that and I, I throw it right back at you. And it means so much to me that you are keeping the flame alive. And I wanted to thank you for that. Now, to get back to the ridiculous question, um, <laughs> some of the things that I, it, it, and, and it sounds, it may sound unfair, but one of the worst things that I feel you can do to portray Harpo is to hire a female actor to do it. I've seen it done far too often, and I'm sorry, we always know it's a lady under the wig. And there's something, you know, unless you have you have a point to make, it, it, it just is not true to what he was all about when you understand the id, the ego of Harpo Marx, and then you see, you know, a female chasing a, another woman or enacting what is, you know, he, he was a very masculine physical character. And to me, it just doesn't quite work. And, and that that to me also is just not having fidelity to to them, you know, and and that may be an unfair thing to say, and I will be the first to admit that it may be unfair because there may be a female performers who who could do circle run circles around a male playing harpo, but that's one of the first things. Um, when you air away, what what I always tried to do, whether it was harpo or Groucho or Chico, would be to, to you know, audiences not necessarily always want to see you recreating exactly what they did, but at the same time, if you err too far away, you're not being uh, true to the characters. I, I feel it comfortable saying that I, that I played them for so long that I had a very good sense of what was legitimately something they would have done as opposed to something that they would not have done. For example, in my one-man show, um, and and then we when it was to go back to Groucho Life and Review when Arthur originally Arthur asked me to be Gabe Kaplan's Groucho consultant, and so I came into the show. As a matter of fact, I I had met Arthur years earlier, but then we first really then reconnected when we were standing side by side in the John taking a leak at the Westwood Theater during intermission of of uh, an early incarnation of what would become eventually Groucho Life and Review, and so. Uh, 
that was where I kind of started getting back into it. And that at that point, it was Gay Playing Groucho, and it was uh, uh, um, you know, Bobby Hedges doing a wonderful Chico. Bobby was so because it was close to his own nature. Bobby was he had all the charm in the world. He was the most charming guy I ever knew, um, and and he was wonderful. And it went through that, and then you know it went through different art incarnations along the line, and. Um, one of the bits, you know, when I got into it, Arthur asked me to do Chico. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. Because he knew, you know, he knew my work. He had seen a night at Harpo's and he saw me doing Minnie's Boys in, in, in uh, L.A. And so he said, you know, I'd like to have you do Chico. And I said, yeah, sure. And the first day of rehearsal, and I knew this was coming, first day of rehearsal, he said, well, man, now that we have you as a Chico, okay, I, I'd kind of like to write you in as Harpo, too. And I said, well, you know what your Aunt Susan feels about that. And said, yeah, well, I was hoping you'd talk to her. So I did. And the, the, the problem had been that she did not like the way Harpo was portrayed in Minnie's Boys. She didn't like the way Arthur had written Harpo. And she kind of said, no more. Uh, you know, don't do this again uh, with, with Harpo. And so I went to her and, and I said, you know, this is what Arthur has, has said. He'd like to write me in as as Harpo and Chico. Uh, and uh, what do I tell him? And she said, well, tell him this. OK, as long as you play it and as long as you write him in. And I said, OK, sure. And so what I basically did was lift some bits from my own show and put them into that show as Harpo. You know, and, and, and Arthur, you know, I, I'm not going to take full responsibility. Of course, Arthur and Bob Fisher had had a lot of input on it. But, you know, for example, one of the, the, the bits that I do is I'm up on stage and I, I spot a woman in the audience and jump down in the audience and, and kiss her. And I'm embracing her. And while I'm embracing her, I'm pulling her bra off. And it's something that, that Harpo, you know, it always brought down the house it was a, it's a tremendous bit I put it into my one man show and then we put it into that show and, and it always brought down the house did Harpo ever do that no um, is it, it perhaps borderline because you have ladies lingerie yeah maybe but maybe not because you know that, that certainly would have been uh, appropriate and considering some of the stories that I have been told about what he did on stage including uh, an event that they did to Maggie Irving on opening night of Animal Crackers so it was pretty funny um I, I feel that I've had a little bit of leeway and uh, there's been trust at least on the family's part for me to have the, the wisdom and judgment to do things that were not necessarily things we saw them do but things that they would have done if somebody had written them in for that so that to me is another thing don't do things that they would not have done unless it is appropriate to who they were because I've seen so many things where it's that ain't right and it's not the characters and you know it, it's okay to come up with bits that aren't the Marx Brothers but then just don't make them the Marx Brothers you know if you want to do that have it be some other guy wearing a wig and doing you know but it's not Harpo anymore and and so those are some of the things that that and I can't remember what the rest of the question is because I've taken the ball and run far too far with it as usual no you ran down the field and scored uh, I'm 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 already Already lost trying to come up with a sports metaphor, but, oh. but that does answer my question. Thanks, Bob. It was about the the philosophical approach to uh, you know the awesome responsibility of trying to be these guys, um, but to not have the weight of that responsibility visible. And I have to be you have to be careful all the time. It's when I was doing Groucho. I was doing Groucho Life and Review in Boston, and th we did the contract scene, of course. And, you know, we, and it always brought down the house. But one night there's Alan Dershowitz sitting in the front row and it was right after it, I'm trying to remember it was about 1990. So it wasn't long after. Um, um, what's the name of the movie where he is portrayed by Ron Silver? I had just come completely out of my mind with Jeremy Irons and, and um, uh, Klaus von Pulo. Um, anyway. Right after that came out, and and you know everybody sees Alan Dershowitz sitting in the front row, all the way through the performance, and I, and I, I you know I just it was one of those things where I didn't feel like I'm not going to acknowledge him, you know, but we get to the contract scene, finish it up, and after we were done, and all the you know the audience is laughing, they're all people. I just scraped them up all off of the ground and threw them at Dershowitz, and I said, I want you to read that and give me a fully detailed brief in the morning, and that's all it took, and that. 
it, it got an even bigger laugh. Well, would Groucho have said that? Yeah, he probably would have. And so it's you know, important to know where that line is. And especially if, as you mentioned, You Bet Your Life is another fertile field for showing us things that Groucho would have said and the later did say. Although, you know, we know the stories about how scripted the show might or might not have been, including what, you know, Miriam told me some things about how, um, you know, because she was she was on the show for a while writing. And she told me, you know, how they had there's a little a scrim teaser just off of, of camera view. And she said that there were times, you know, you would see him take the uh, puff the cigar and then look up for a moment. And it was because there were all these notes that had been pinned to the backside of this scrim, the, the teaser, and that a lot of them were, OK, if the person says this, here's something you can say. And they would not, you know, she as she told me, they, they tried not to give him material out and out material. But they would give him suggestions of which way to go. And and it's interesting when you watch You Bet Your Life and you see a whole new range of what Groucho said um, and, and you know, certainly on the, the, the things that are legitimately ad lib that he did. It's like, oh, boy, there's a whole ton of new material, not necessarily specific material, but a whole range of different areas in which Groucho's mind could work. That's, and you can see his mind work oh, in yes, those, yeah. uh, on those episodes. When, whenever I'm playing... And Groucho, I usually uh, do a deep uh, immersion in You Bet Your Life because after a while you start to think like him. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can sort of recognize what's going on in his head and um, sometimes you, you laugh at what he says before he even says it because you can see it. You can see the joke uh, percolating. Well, and this is the thing. When I very, the very first time I went into that house and I, I was taken you know, back and it was John Ballow um, who was yeah. one that, and, and also, and I can't remember her name, but the nurse of the time um, they knew Aaron wasn't going to be there that day, so they knew it was fine and safe to bring me in. And so, you know, so they take me all the way in the back of the house where his little office was, and there he was. And again, I've got this blank where his face was. But um, I said, you know, Groucho, it's it's nice to finally meet you because I'm one of your biggest fans, and I've always wanted to meet you. And he, you know, how he was at the end, the strokes, the heart attacks he had had, it was difficult for him to speak. And uh, the thing was, if you gave him time, no matter what you said, something would come back and you saw those wheels turning. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to meet you. And, and so you saw spinning, spinning, spinning. Well, now you have met me. Goodbye. <laughs> and that was that was the first you know, the conversation, the first, the, the first few words that I had with him that day. And it was just wonderful because it was kind of like at the same time, I'm still here. I'm still just as funny if you give me time. And he, he, it was, it was wonderful. And what I've just done, I didn't want to protract it to the level that he did because it was much, it took him a long time to, to get that much out. But, uh, you know, what, what an amazing experience that was to make that that connection yeah that i mean and and also just to know that uh, even if the machine was um operating a little slower um that it was still operating yeah and that given the physical tools to do it he um he would have been undiminished and brilliant forever oh yeah if only if only somehow there could be a magical pill to have kept him alive he would still be out you know he'd be 127 today 100 yeah 127 but i have no doubt that he he would be just as timely today as he was. You know, when you, you read some of the things that he would say or uh, wrote in the 60s and 70s, they're damned funny. And there's no wonder why he became, you know, on he, he had his FBI file and he was on Nixon's enemies list. And there's a perfect reason for that. He was wonderful at social commentary as a humorist and, and saying the sorts, you know, what they all did, saying the things we wish we would say if we had the nerve. Yeah, it's funny just talking to you about it. I just uh, it it becomes overwhelming, and I feel like uh, it feels like we're talking about you know Mozart or Shakespeare. <laughs> well, and in a way we are. In a way we really really are. Um, you know, and and I I guess I, I would have to you know knowing knowing the extent of Mozart's mind and certainly this in, entity that we know of as Shakespeare, I would have to say yeah probably that that could be a slight exaggeration, but certainly not that much. You know because he was brilliant. You know, but they all were. They all. Harpo, Harpo and Groucho particularly were just brilliant. And 
in a non, you know, in Harpo's case, in a non-schooled way, Groucho's case, the cases, um, amazing autodidacticism that he, he it, it was, and I, I feel like maybe there's another connection I have with him because I have always been profoundly a believer in intellectual curiosity, in, in I, I, I have got to get up and hit the road learning every single day, and I think that that is an important part of, of uh, maybe a connection that, that makes me uh, respond to Groucho as well, um, you know, because that, that was him. He, he was so compelled by learning and knowing and, you know, he, he was so valued the friendships that he had in the intellectual world. And, and you have to look at Harpo's side, too, because he wasn't after all that learning. But why was it that he was the darling of the learned ones? You know, that, that incredibly brilliant, innate mind of his. Yeah. What are your what are your theories about that? I mean, it's always said that um, he his presence was valued at the Algonquin Round Table because he was a listener uh, rather than a, a, a competitor. But there's more to it than yeah, that. Yeah, right? and, and they have also said that Harpo would sit there and listen and listen and listen and not say a word. And then there would be a lull in the conversation. And then Harpo would toss out the line that would top everybody. And and so I think, you know, part of that all, you know, that is an important part of it. But I think it also is the part that he, he was viewed, particularly from the, the standpoint of Wolcott, you, you know, as being this, this special being, this not quite human being, this this superhuman being in a way and I think that you know from what you know the description has been told to me of both Chico and Harpo um, that the Chico to simply know him, to simply meet him, you loved him. And that it didn't matter if you were man, woman, child, or animal, you loved Chico. Even, almost just simply by contact. By And Harpo was described to me in the very same way. And I have a feeling that it was a part of his own natural charm. But also, I've always felt with Harpo... There may have been just a slight, slight, he may have been an enigma. And there may have been that element of, wow, I want to get to know that. I want to crack that. You know, there's something special there. And we see a good deal of it on the surface, but there's more beneath the surface. I have a feeling that was also a lot of his attraction within the Algonquin Roundtable. Um, and, and uh, you know, but he, he was able to hold his own with all those wits, you know, the lines of the pop. And, and, you know, I'm sure that in that intensely competitive world of humor and when you can you know when you, you've got Kaufman and Dorothy Parker and FPA and the people that you have sitting there uh, you have these brilliant minds uh, of humor and then you have this special thing he didn't he, unlike the others he didn't make his living by writing humor they all did they were all you know whether it was it was you know playwrights or critics or or novelists or essayists they all wrote their their humor Harpo didn't. Harpo was exactly the opposite, and yet he was a different layer of humor. And I think that that's also part of that attraction, um, because he was brilliantly funny, and they they in a way that they perhaps wanted to tap into. Maybe they were thinking they could learn from that. Harpo did also. I mean, I know Roland Barber is is. Uh, partly and maybe largely to thank for Harpo Speaks. Um, but, uh, you know, working with a collaborator is not unheard of in literature. And I, it always um, impresses me that Harpo is the Marx brother who left us a truly great book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and what an incredible book that is. And I do think that, that you know, Barber gets a lot of um, either credit or um, uh, criticism for creating a lot of that book. But we don't know how much he did. And I, I mean, I've heard Bill has played for me extensive uh, tapes that Harpo did. And I'm sure some of those are now online. Uh, and you can hear Harpo describing, for example, Mrs. Shang and, and, yeah. and some of the various stories. And, and I've heard quite a few more, but I've also heard <sighs> Harpo singing ah, How That Woman Could Cook While He Plays the Piano and ends the song, does the whole thing with ah, How That Woman Could Cook. Shit. And it's hilarious. It's Harpo. It's Harpo. Doing it. I, I, I think that that Barber may have shaped that book a bit, but I don't think he shaped the content too much. I think that Harpo relished the the 
opportunity of speaking and recalling these stories. And and Susan has told me that his memory was terrible. He, you know, and they all were. They they all would tell the same story as it would, in the first person that this story happened to me when we know Chick has already said it happened to him. You know, they all did that. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't make the stories any less valuable. It doesn't make them any less amusing. I mean, it could have happened to Wheeler and Woolsey, and they stole stole the stories from them. It, it doesn't matter. It was this life of a vaudevillian, um, and and you know, then later, of course, when we get into the 30s, then it's more verifiable because Susan was there to verify. But then Bill, on the same side, has said, "Oh, well, Susan's memory was not very good too." And there were a lot of things I had to correct her on. She would, you know, we'd be in conversation, and she wouldn't remember what, ha- and then I would have to, no, that wasn't, you know, you didn't meet him then, you met him here. Oh, that's right. And she, you know, she, uh, we first met she, when she was in her late 60s. And, and uh, you know, her memory was I, – I don't know that it was necessarily that her memory was not good or that she just didn't care um, about being accurate. And she may have picked that up from Harpo because I always felt that was part of him. You know, Chico certainly we know if it made a better story than reality, go with the better story. Uh, and I have a feeling that that was certainly kind of the case with, with uh, Harpo a bit. And, and and so I, I think it's a tremendous book. Uh, and it, it was one of those things where that's really what hooked me into wanting to know more and present the real man on stage. Um, and so much of my material would originate in stories that I read in in um, Harpo Speaks, but then I didn't want to, you know, lift them. I wanted to then get them from Susan. I wanted to get them from friends of theirs. And so that's what I would do. Well, an interesting source, and I'm so sorry that I did not press it, but Howard Teichman, who wrote The Solid Gold Cadillac with, with um, uh, Kaufman, uh, wrote his yeah. book on Kaufman. And, yes. And I, I tracked down his number and I called him one day because I had been told that he had hours and hours and hours of, of recordings of Harpo, that Harpo, he had interviewed Harpo for the Teichman book, for the, the Kaufman book. And I talked to him and at that point, Teichman was in very, very bad health and he didn't die too much longer after. And I, I talked to him for quite some time on the phone about Harpo and I kept trying to I, I said you know I would love to hear these tapes and uh, you know I, I uh, very carefully and delicately uh, tried to find out what was going to become of the tapes and all he would tell me is that uh, he had had his instructions from Harpo and later on he died Teichman died and and quite a while later I didn't want to be ghoulish or anything. Uh, I called his wife and said, I'm, you know, and she knew who I was. And, and I just said, I um, wanted to, you know, I let you know that Howard had told me uh, what was going to happen with the tapes. And, and she said, it has. And so there was another potential source of stories. Maybe Teichman had jarred Harpo's memories in a different way. They were more going to be about Kaufman, and that would be a different period of time. You know, really, that would have been the 20s and 30s, mostly. And so it would have been interesting to know what those tapes were about. But I have the feeling that they did. They do not exist anymore. Wow. That's interesting. I wonder. uh, Yeah. I wonder if if Teichman's archive wound up someplace or if it ended up as it should have from what I was told, it does not exist anymore. Yeah. Which is a shame. Well, so much of uh, history slips through our fingers that way. Um, if you manage to grab onto a little bit of it, it's, uh, it's a momentous occasion. It, it is. But then it, it, you know, it, it ties into that whole ephemeral ma- nature of the arts themselves and if they, of, the, of the performing arts as opposed to the visual arts. You know, I, because there is something that, that is so special about, oh, that performance, it was amazing on Tuesday night. Well, if you weren't there, you missed it. And that makes it even more special, I think. If it were preserved on film, then maybe, oh, well, yeah, it was pretty nice. It was good, but it wasn't special. And I think the same thing might apply to all of these mysteries. It's like what Bill told me, what I shared with you, that that perhaps if I had known Harpo, I wouldn't have been as fascinated by him. Um, you know, the fact that I never did meet him, the fact that I never met Chico, maybe would have made them uh, less, and they would have given them the feet of clay. I don't know. You know, possibly. Yeah. Although I would like to imagine that they never would have had feet of clay to begin with. They certainly uh, refused to um, uh, 
uh, mythologize themselves. And, you know, they never spoke about themselves as artists, you know. Show business was their job, and they had a seemingly a very practical um, work-a-day, nuts-and-bolts approach to being to being Mozart or Shakespeare. Right, right. And it's that thing, too, I, and I've always felt this profoundly, trying to analyze comedy is the surest way to kill it. Um, you know, especially with them when they were, you know, came up through 20 years of vaudeville. That That's that's your training. That's how you analyze comedy by not thinking about it. You instinctively feel it. The greatest instructor is that audience, and they teach you what's funny. They teach you what works, what doesn't work. And I think it's amazing that even when they were at the, their, their prime, when they were back, you know, in the, at MGM, what do they want to do? They wanted to try the material out on the road because even though they had, you know, decades of experience, they still wanted to fine tune. And I love the stories about how Groucho would would play with one word until he got it exactly right from night to night. And and it's and it, it it's a testament, I think, not only to their profound experience, but then also their wisdom in realizing we can't just rely on our experience. Let's go one step further, get it back in front of an audience again, and see what works. And timing wise, how it plays and that that is admirable that MGM went along with that the thought Falber went along with that and you know it's a shame that he had to go up and die but oh well at the same time, I, 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 I can be rather critical about the MGM period simply because I, I, I hate what it did to their characters. And, I you know, I, we all have our varying, those of us who are into the, the whole Marx Brothers idiom, uh, we have our own feelings. But I, I just, I feel MGM demolished them. And particularly, you know, not if the opera is not bad. Day at the Races is, uh, is uh, not quite as good. But then when they so heavily relied upon that that formula and it just became ground into the dust and and when Louis B. Mayer would not spend what he had, to, what he really should have spent on them to get them the top-notch writers and directors that they really, really needed, that that you know, in a way, it was well, exactly what like what he did with Buster Keaton. It was you had this tremendous asset and you just frittered it away because you wouldn't allow it to be itself. You wouldn't allow it to be the best of what it was. You know, Keaton knew what he was doing. The Marx Brothers knew what they were doing. Support that by giving them what they need to make them even better. And when it was was just they were trying to force them into that MGM mold and to be just you know, demolished who they were about. The Marx Brothers should never have been about helping people or helping a you know, young couple. The all you know, you know, no, no, they, they should be pulling her bra off, you know. Yes, it's uh, the the actual um, permanent record of the Marx Brothers on film is such a limited supply. Um, it, and, you know, if you. I mean, 13 movies is not a lot anyway, and consider maybe half of them are great. Um, and on one hand, uh, that's something to regret. But on the other hand, if there were a, um, a more generous supply of authentic uh, Marx Brothers stuff to sit down and watch, um, there'd be less of a need for guys like us to <laughs> try to s- squeeze a little more Marx Brothers. Exactly. Yeah, and, and when you come down to it, I mean... <sighs> What I would have loved to have seen was not more of the films, but more of the early years. I would have loved to have seen the development. You know, I would have loved to have seen Mr. Green's reception in Home Again. And you know, I would have loved to have seen how they were becoming those characters. And, you know, it's interesting to me that when you see, for example, Coconuts, as I just did again, the character of Groucho still feels as though it's, it's kind of half cooked. It's not all there. Um, you know, and, and there are lots of elements of it that are great, but it doesn't have the range that he later got. And it, and, and, uh, it, it kind of blows me away when I see that and then I imagine the, you know, Professor Quincy Adams Wagstaff and then the huge difference, uh, or Rufus Firefly, the huge difference between Mr. Hammer and that. It's a big difference. Yeah, I, I think his um, growing comfort with uh, film as a medium had something to do with that. I, sometimes, um, as much as I love coconuts, and I love coconuts more every time I see it, actually, but, um, but there is a sense of, this isn't really what he was like on stage is it i mean it's a it's a whisper of what he did on stage but groucho and chico both seem sort of uncomfortable in in that film yeah their performances where you could almost imagine stock actors playing the roles where you can't imagine that with harpo in that that film you know and i and that's oversimplifying and of course we know that the, the the there were the what london productions of and i'm trying to remember which shows if they did coconuts oh yes with a different cast you know and they did taylor 
tailor the show a bit there, but it would have been, I'll tell you, doing Groucho a Life from Review in London was wonderful because the audiences were, you know, the material is, their material is so akin to the British sensibility of humor. And so the British audiences were really hip and they were really getting it in some ways, even more than some of the New York audiences got it. And it was, you know, to me, it was it was a shame that the that the run could not have continued for much longer than it did. The Lawrence and Olivier nominations were wonderful. It was that you know that was a tremendous thing. But the, the tragedy was that that came out just after the show had posted its closing notice, and we couldn't, you know, apparently the theater had already been been promised elsewhere, and so you know there were no available theaters. We could, you know, and it was it was a shame. Uh, but circumstances being what they were, that you know that's all history. Well, Les, as uh, as Chico used to say in rehearsal in Hollywood, uh, it's after quitting time in New York. But uh, Les, this has been so great. Thank you for this. And uh, I hope it's the first of many conversations, uh, maybe even in person someday. Um, I just can't thank you enough. The thrill is mine. And uh, seriously, I, I, I have so enjoyed this, not just the conversation, but the friendship. And and I, uh, any time you're up for it, and, and the thing that you've done that no other person has been able to to do is to get me familiar with and using Skype. This is my very first. I, I tried it out <laughs> on my mother-in-law last night. We, we said, let's, let's make sure that I've configured everything properly. So, you know, unfortunately, you're my second, but uh, you, know, you are <laughs> far more valuable than my mother-in-law was last night in terms of building a friendship. Uh, thank you, Les. Good. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> We'll be back again in a couple of weeks with episode number five of the Marx Brothers Council podcast. We have a special guest and a special theme show, which we really, really think is going to be spectacular. But we haven't taped it yet, so who knows? But in the meantime, we're going to leave you with Les Marsden on the harp from Animal Crackers. Take care, everyone. Thank you.